very warm welcome to Birmingham Edgbaston for the UK conclave of the Warriors. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Oh, I hope you're all having a very good day and we're joined here with Michael Beck who plays Swan and Brian Tyler who played Snow. So I want to give you a good warm welcome to everyone here please. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you will be given a chance to ask your questions so please feel free and I'll come over Try not to run. <laughs> and Karen, you know, you're more welcome to ask your questions. So, welcome to the UK, guys. How are you? We're fine. <laughs> we'll get there in a bit. We're back and We're forth. fine. We're thrilled to be here. We thank uh, all of you for coming out to, to see us. Uh, you know, it's always amazing to see uh, the number of people, really, uh, all across the world who love this picture. We had little or no idea when we made this movie that it would have uh, the kind of lasting effect. So we thank all of you for coming out to see us. And we're here to answer any questions that you have that we're able to answer or willing to answer. So there you go. <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, it's your first time here, isn't it, Brian, I think? Or? Yes, this is my first time uh, in England. So thank you, because I'm definitely coming back. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, well, welcome. <laughs> For, for the sheer fact that, again, the crowd, that's our invite, so thank you. Yes, and Michael's been here um, many times before. He trained in London at the Drama um, College. Central School of Central Speech. Central School of Speech, yes. So he's very accustomed to Britain, and it's great to have these guys here. So, guys, The Warriors is such a massive phenomenon. Do you think it would have been, it's such, um, it would have been this big? Yeah, what the, uh, I just get all tongue -tied. Well, when we made it? <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I don't know that... Uh, did Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman know that they were going to have a, a cult classic when they made Casablanca? Probably not. They were just working and making a movie, uh, so we had no idea. I mean, and most of us were... Uh, for many, it was the, their very first film. Uh, for a couple of others of us, it was like our second film. So we were fairly new at uh, filmmaking, so, uh, you know, I don't think anyone, including Walter Hill or Larry Gordon, the producer, had an idea that this movie would become the beloved kind of cult classic movie that, it, that it's become, no. Oh, most definitely. There's no, I, in my opinion, I don't think you could make this now. Uh, it's just not, it's not possible. You know, back then, it was the streets of New York are completely different. And, um, yeah, tell us about that, you know, the, the, how it was filming, Brian. How was that filming in the streets? Well, in... In the late 70s in New York, it was a much different city, much tougher. We did have problems with actual gangs when we did the movie. Uh, we somehow smoothed things out. It all worked out well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not so many. <laughs> um, but yeah, much, much different time then. And um, it's like many other occupations. When you have a group of people that come in to do the best job that they can and are professionals like Michael, certainly. It was my first movie. Uh, I had done off-Broadway stage. Uh, and these guys were, at the time, my mentors because I'd never done that before. But we all did the best job we could and thank God it's become what it has. Yeah. Oh, most definitely. It was um, incredible. Um, so in the streets then, when you're running around, you've got these actual gangs. Um, I hear that you had some like protection to stop, you know, you were told um, which streets not to go to, you know, just to uh, save yourself from being beaten up, basically. <laughs> so you, know, you don't want to be having that problem when you're acting. So um, I, I hear there was some, um, like a gang was asked to look after the cast. Is that true? A gang. Was there like a gang um, asked like, to come in to protect you? Well, no, we didn't have an actual gang protect us, but we had some rather large, muscular gentlemen who I think probably were police officers or ex-military or they were, they knew what they were doing. So, you know, and they were kind of on the set. Um, but the incidents that we had with, uh, with actual street gangs were not many. I think they have been become mythology over the years, you know. Uh, but we did actually, uh, the, the, the thing I remember most, we, we went, I think it was to a location in the Bronx one night, and uh, 
all that was going to be shot on that location was just a walk by, you know, of the warriors walking down this street. And the reason that Walter Hill chose this particular location was because on both sides of the street, there were derelict, burned out buildings. They had no glass in the windows. Some had no window frames. It kind of looked like Dresden after World War II. I mean, it was just completely a bombed out area of, of the Bronx. And all we were gonna do is just walk down the street because they wanted that kind of image. And, you know, so we start shooting after dark. So it gets to be nine or 10 o'clock at night when it actually gets dark in the middle of the summer uh, in New York. And they've wet the streets down and we're, we finally are set to do this, sh this shot of just us walking down the street and then they're gonna pack up and go to another location. And as soon as uh, Walter Hill called action, all of those empty windows in this derelict buildings filled up with all these kids, these street gangs, who started yelling obscenities and stuff at us. So we didn't get to shoot that location. We just packed up and the circus went somewhere else. But that was an incident where the, those actual street, it was their turf, and obviously the location manager had not passed around enough green stuff, so they weren't gonna let us shoot that night, and we didn't. So, you know, it was that kind of incident as opposed to us being threatened in any way. Yeah, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Terry. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. It was nice of you to join us here. <laughs> yes, yeah, so hi. I still got the big one. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, Terry Nikos, everyone. <laughs> so. Yeah, Terry played Vermin in the um, production. So tell us, um, how, how was it for you? That's a broad question. Uh, uh, you mean about the Warriors? Yeah, about the Warriors. Oh, God. Uh, well, first of all, we're all really close. And after that many years, 40 years, that's difficult to do when you come out of films. You can ask a lot of these guys. We're very close friends. And uh, when we get together, it's... Um, the warriors. We just, we just, uh, our families know each other, and uh, it's a good thing. Actually, making the film, it was my first film. Didn't really know uh, much about it. I just was glad I had an acting job. You know, when you're an actor, when you're working, you're on vacation. When you're not working, you uh, feel like you're working. No one gets that. Sit down. <laughs> One thing you, you've got to learn, we're all still in shape. <laughs> you don't want to be publicly embarrassed. <laughs> anyway, the film was great, but it was, uh, it was long, it was grueling. Uh, we ran multiple, multiple times. You saw the final cut, but they made those scenes were cut many, many times. I don't know if Michael or Brian told you, but they cast actors that they felt physically could handle the, the gruelingness of the schedule. And, um, you know, the years later, I think I can say, is when I've appreciated how much I love the Warriors and all that we've done. Because doing it, I mean, I, we got along all well, but you know, we were busy. We were young, and it's, it's more refined now. It's great. And we love seeing all of you. It's just great. So, um, yeah, definitely. So, in 2015, you had the reunion at Coney Island, I believe. So, Michael, what was that like for you meeting all the guests again, you know, the, crowd, um, the fans? Well, in uh, 2015, when we first had uh, a reunion in, in Coney Island, uh, we had had a reunion back, uh, yeah, 2009, that Netflix and uh, Alamo Draft House Cinema put on. But it was different. But it did culminate in, at Coney Island. So this wasn't the first time. But this was a phenomenal uh, event. And I see faces back there of people who were there uh, for that event. Uh, the, like seven, seven to 8,000 people showed up on a really hot September day. It was a one-day deal, which I think for all of us really humbled us to think that that many people on one day would come, 
you know, yeah. to just see us. You know, it was it was really pretty amazing. Uh, it was it was an awesome event. We tried to recreate it the next year, and you know, you just can't mine the same hole over and over. You need to give it some time for for things. So the the second year was not as uh, successful in a lot of ways, but that first year was really pretty phenomenal. Yeah, because Brian, you were telling me last night about you how you appreciate the people coming to see you, and they actually brought you figurines and things, um, like Lego figurines. Yeah, I had a gentleman, uh, again, we're amazed that there are people here that came to New York just to see us. Uh, we're, we're seeing people from all around the world. Australia, we're talking some serious flight time just to get to New York to see us. And there was a gentleman from England, I don't know if he's here, uh, who, there's never been a snow figurine made. This gentleman by hand made this figurine and gave it to me at Coney Island last year. I, I was astounded, you know? So it was, you guys, if it weren't for you, we would not be here. So again, thank you. Oh, well, Stephanie, so when did you actually realize how big, you know, the Warriors was? 2009, 2009, at that yeah. Draft House uh, event, yeah. yeah, yeah. For me, uh, uh, the first time I had any inkling that uh, the Warriors was be becoming a cult classic movie uh, was in the early to mid 80s, somewhere around 83 or 84. I had a friend who had gone to Paris and when he came back, he said, you're not gonna believe this. I was in Paris and they were having midnight showings of the Warriors and lining the streets to get in, that queued up, were people dressed up as the characters. So I thought, gosh, well, there's something going on here. But for me, when I really knew, I, uh, my, uh, my oldest uh, child is 34 now. When he was probably 14, so 20 years ago, uh, he, he came home with a couple of his friends after school, and one of his buddies walked in who had not been to our house before. You know, a lot of those kids grew up in our house. It was that kind of house, but this new, new kid in the clique came in, and he walked in, and, and he dropped the F-bomb. Fuck! You're, you're Swan and the Warriors. And I thought, well, if a 14-year-old knows that and drops the F-bomb in front of my wife, he's a kind of crazy kid to do that. But I knew that, that you know, you, you think, how do they know about, you know, how does this generation even know about this movie? And yet, uncles and dads and moms, you know, they, you know, sometimes take their five-year-olds and <laughs> let them watch it, uh, which, you know, but yeah, it, sometime, you know, then, kind of the 80s, mid-80s, uh, you know, I had an inkling that something was going on there. How about you, Jim? Yeah, give you a chance. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I think when I started working in the news and uh, all these young camera people and technicians were like shaken and nervous when they were around me and I said, what's and they said, I can't believe it. And there was all this kind of quiet talk behind him that this guy was in the Warriors. And I didn't, I, I didn't even know anything about what went on with the Warriors. And I said, well, how did you know about it? They said, are you kidding me? We would hang out and, and go in pitch dark rooms and all dress up like we were one of the Warriors. And I was vermin like you, and this guy was Swan. And they would have these parties when HBO started coming out in the late 70s, early 80s. And it seemed to have gone underground and built this following that I knew nothing about. I was just uh, raising a family. And just to the point about um, a lot of women. How did you get on that point? I'm making it. <laughs> I'm vermin. Boy, segue, <laughs> How did I get with the Lizzie's and you didn't? <laughs> I used my brain. So, so anyway, uh, no. uh, a lot of women and young girls like this movie. And I've always, you know, wondered. I mean, they, they intensely like it. Not exactly sure why, but I keep thinking, would that happen if they tried to remake it now? And I don't think it would because they would, because we were fighting in a way that they could relate to. But now they'd be, there'd be blood everywhere. They'd be, you know, blowing people's heads off. It would be a different type of gang, and I don't think it would appeal. 
the way it did when guys just got down and, f and fought. And I think that in the, in the idea of trying to recreate it, and they may, because nobody can think of anything. How many times has Grease been done on Broadway or My Fair Lady? Like six now, you know, they can't come up with anything. But I don't think they would be able to make what happened happen at that time and that place, just my own feeling. But anyway, we really appreciate it, y'all. Yeah, I definitely don't think it would work nowadays. Um, but what about the film speaks to people, Terry, do you think? I'm not sure. I came as a fake New Yorker, you know. I mean, these real New York guys like Dorsey and Brian, I don't know, Michael came from the Midwest, but he had a New York background. I just, uh, everybody said that what speaks to people is the, they brought them into the world of New York City at a time when it was real hard and wild, and they had never been there, so they got to kind of come into this world. I think also, and I don't want to uh, wax philosophical too much, but Dorsey was talking uh, last night, we were having a conversation, and he said, I think what made the Warriors appealing way ahead of its time was that they had this multiracial group that got along, hung out, no one got into the race issue, and all the, he said the gangs would never be that way in the 70s. He said that there would never be multiracial groups. It was all racial, broken down by that. And he said, I think people just felt like, you know what, I don't have to get into politically correct stuff. I'm just watching a bunch of people that I like, and they're fighting for their lives, and they're doing it together side by side, and everyone can relate to that. So that's a theory. But you know what? I was an actor, and I was glad I had a job. Didn't think much about it. Well, I think that one of the things that's appealing about that particular movie, and, and there are other movies that have that same theme, it's a really simple storyline. And I think it's something that we all relate to, but many times we relate to it because we have a nightmare about it. It's the innocently accused who are fleeing from everyone who is trying to destroy them to get back to a place of safety. And all people can relate to that. Exactly. I mean, you know, and uh, on some level, and I think th the simplicity of that is the theme that catches uh, the audience that's watched it. Plus, you know, like Terry was saying, you're visually, it's a really ahead of its time kind of movie. Uh, the, you know, you see a New York City with wet streets and no people on it. Well, I can tell you 24 seven, there's always people on the streets in New York. You don't walk down a street where there's nobody there, right? It's just, you know, it's, so it, it's, and I think, and it had a great soundtrack, but you know, it's a really old story that's just retold of, you know, that lost patrol trying to get home where all of the enemy is out to get them. And, you know, and you're pulling for them. You know, you're pulling for yeah. them to get home. It's like someone said, I didn't say it, I heard someone say it. They said it was, it, it had the same theme that Michael's talking about as the Wizard of Oz. There's no place like home. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to go on about now the, the conclave at the beginning of the film. So we got the Cyrus has called Egwin over to come. And that scene must have been quite difficult to film because you've got a hell of a lot of extras. I believe it was 1,500 extras. And, you know, it's so much mayhem, you know, with the, the um, scenes when they're running away. Um, how was that, Terry, for you? I'm not Terry, sorry, Brian. <laughs> um, again, you, there was an incredible production team that wrangled many people, and they did it very well. So that was one of the strong points that helped us do our job is with every night, especially in Riverside Park when we had thousands of extras. And a lot of these people who were there that night were not actors. And there were no problems. I, I, there, do you remember any problems? I mean, yeah. you know. If there were, we weren't aware of it. Yeah, if, if there were, we weren't aware of it, but it wasn't something that was uh, really an issue. And there, there are parts of New York where you can walk down at night and there's nobody there, well, Brooklyn and Queens, uh, but not New York City, not, not Manhattan. So everywhere we were, there were people, whether you saw them or not. <laughs> yeah. 
I think one of the, the most interesting things about that conclave uh, scene uh, that the, the, uh, the first AD shared with me, you know, a few weeks after we had shot that scene, because it took probably a week or better to shoot that entire scene, you know. Uh, and they were finding in the in the dailies when the when the when Walter and Larry Gordon and the producers would look at the dailies that over a couple of days, because you know people come in to be extras in a movie and they, and it's like fun. I've never done this before, and it's going to be kind of cool and glamorous, and it really isn't because you're just you know extras are the lowest person on the totem pole, so they're not treated great. They don't get as good food as the crew and the cast get. They get the stale sandwiches on the side. And it's mainly, it's kind of like the army, it's hurry up and wait. And you just are sitting there for hours doing nothing. And then, you know, for a few minutes you're doing something and then you're sitting for hours. So what happens is you do it one night and you go, Screw this, I'm not coming back. So what happened was they were seeing in the dailies that the, because there were African Americans, there were Hispanics, there were uh, Caucasians, they were seeing that the, that the complexion of the crowd was changing because not the same people were coming back. So what they did cleverly, you said they were cleverly, they started raffling off television sets and things. So people got raffle tickets, but it was at the end of the week you were gonna have the, that's when you knew whether you were gonna take home a TV set or something. So, yeah. this, so that more and more of the same people would at least show up, which yeah. I thought was really, you know, pretty interesting, but yeah. I, you know, it really made sense. Cause I, I, you know, my heart has always gone out to extras. I think, oh, it's such a thankless job. And I know a lot of people do it who are non-actors, but they just wanna be, on a movie and see what it's like, and they find out that, gosh, this was really not as glamorous as I thought it was gonna be. Yeah. I'm not sure anybody got a TV. <laughs> <laughs> I hate this. <laughs> but, 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 <laughs> and the other thing, you know, they're standing around all day. I mean, they don't have trailers. We would go to trailers and we'd sleep if we had uh, long, long, you know, waits. And they're just standing there all day out there. So, you know, uh, a lot of the scenes just took a long time. The bathroom scene, the, fi the uh, uh, 96 minutes, like seconds of film maybe. It took us two weeks to film. I don't, it could be you know, more or less, but it, you know, you, and you just turn around, throw a punch. And they to, I mean, when he was flipping people into the stalls, they had to pull out the back of the stall, get the camera in there so you could see it coming over. I mean, everything was tedious. The best part is when they took a wide shot where we actually can just do the whole fight. But that was, you know, not much of that uh, bathroom scene. It was long, tedious, and tiring. Uh, when you see the final cut, and it became the Warriors, which brought all of you here, that's cool. Oh, definitely. And in, in that film, you actually did your own stunts, I believe. And in the bathroom scene, poor Deborah, I think I, I read that she actually got hurt the most. Um, Deborah, I mean, played Mercy. Yeah, she didn't get hurt in the bathroom scene. Deborah, I mean, most of, the, I think, the rest of us, other than maybe bumps and bruises, didn't get injured at all. But Deborah, good old Mercy, uh, in the scene on the subway uh, where the, the cop is running toward Swan and uh, Mercy, and Swan takes a baseball bat and throws it and hits the cop in the shins. Well, that's, you know, any of those fights or those kind of sequences are choreographed, kind of like a dance. So I had to take Deborah by the hand and push her back, and she had to hit of specific marks, on pieces of tape on the ground. She had to be on them because I'm not looking at her. I push her back, she gets on the, the thing, and I take the baseball bat back like this and throw it. So I push her back knowing that Deborah's gonna get on the marks. Well, she missed the marks, but I didn't look back to see where she was. I'm looking at the guy I'm gonna throw the bat at. So when I swing the bat back, it hit her right in the eyebrow, busted her eye open, she had to have sutures. So that's why Mercy, for 
the rest of the movie halfway through has this spit curl in the middle of her forehead that's spirit gummed to her eyes to cover up the sutures. She also, yes, yeah, she also in the in the sequence where the fox gets thrown under the train and they're running through uh, down the uh, subway platforms, coming down the coming down those stairs. She's running with uh, you know a, a, a camera double instead of uh, the fox, and she tripped and broke her arm. Hence, she then wears a blue coat to cover up the cast, not because hey, cops are looking for somebody in a pink vest. No. <laughs> I've got a cast on, and we don't want anybody to know that I've got to wear it for the next six weeks. So she got, yeah, she was a trooper. She got banged up pretty good in that movie. What were you going to say? <laughs> yeah, that's such a, um, a good answer. You know, poor Deborah bless her. She couldn't be here today. But um, is there anyone who's got any questions you want to ask the guys? If you didn't, now, just turn us up all. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, just want to ask, what was your favourite scene you um, liked the most from the movie? Uh, the bathroom scene for me. Well, I really got to use my chops. As many of you know, uh, I'm trained in uh, martial arts, so that's where I got to really use it. So, and I didn't get hurt. <laughs> And you used it well. Uh, well. You know, I enjoyed a lot of those scenes. Uh, I think my favorite action sequence um, was the, the fury fight from, from coming out of uh, the subway station and seeing those guys in the street to running, the whole thing. And that, uh, like Terry was saying, that was a sequence that probably took us at least 10 nights to shoot, but it was a really fun scene to do. I mean, I loved the, the fighting in it with the baseball bats and things like, so that was my favorite action scene. My favorite scene scene to have been involved in was the scene with uh, Swan and Mercy on the subway uh, where the prom couple comes on because uh, I, as an actor, y you always love a scene where you communicate to an audience without using words. And that was a really powerful scene, I think, that did that. So that was my most fun scene to, to be involved in, you know, just purely from a communicating point of view. How about you, Terry? Uh, I guess with the Lizzie's, because I was kissing <laughs> girls all night. <laughs> I mean, when I got off that subway and I saw you, I thought, oh baby, throw it my way. Problem is, off the set, these guys were with the Lizzie's, not me. <laughs> not him. Anyway, um, there was a lot of fun times. One of the most fun was during break. We would eat lunch at, you know, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, 12 uh, uh, in the morning, uh, a.m. and 1 a.m., and they'd bring in chicken marsala and wine. and this, but We would eat like horses every day. I mean, it was fun. We were all drinking. Um, <laughs> But, you know, they ran us so hard, so much, and we were young, um, we still looked lean and mean. I don't know what to tell you. But it was very, it was, it was very nice being part of the film. Um, as you know, or don't know, I almost wasn't in the film. Uh, they had brought 11 warriors to Paramount Pictures, potential warriors, and I think they were, they were keeping nine. I may have the numbers wrong, but I know that they were measuring us and looking us and matching us up. And then about two weeks later, my agent called and said, they're not using you for the Warriors. And um, I was really disappointed. I had done Grease on Broadway and a similar thing had happened and I got on it. So I went home and you know, it was very long, three or four months and then, um, the person who had my, not my role, but it would have been my role because we're very similar types, it got switched, was Tony Danza. But he got taxi. And so he left the Warriors and then they called me back. But they made me audition again. What was that about? <laughs> and they finally... <laughs> <laughs> and and, and um, 
they finally cast me, and so I was sort of an afterthought. But I do think that, you know, how this particular character and Vermin fit in with these guys um, was right. And um, I was very grateful for that. Hi, guys. Um, the, the film itself, I know that there were some changes along the way, so Berman was in for longer than he was supposed to be, and Fox left a bit sooner. How much of the final film that we all love was, was pre-planned and pre-scripted, and how much of it was allowed to evolve once filming began? Well, you know, the, for my character, the biggest change, uh, everyone hear that question? Uh, you know, that there were changes that happened in the movie as, as we filmed it that were different from the scripts that we were shooting off of. And the biggest change that, that the Swan character went through in the original script when we started shooting the movie, Swan's character was meant to be captured by a rival gang called the Dingoes and tortured and then escape and hook up with the guys again, you know, for the final sequence on the beach with the, with the rogues. Uh, Fox, the Fox was supposed to end up with Mercy. So that's a big change uh, and what happened there. And, and in a, another Q&A, uh, uh, Tommy Waits will be able to address that, uh, is that partway through the, the shooting, uh, there was some, well, you know, there, there was some friction between Tom and uh, the director and producer, and they finally just came to a, to a place where they felt it would be better if Tom were no longer part of, of the movie. And Tom will openly address that to you guys, so that's not my story. Uh, and what had happened also, I think, is uh, that they saw just in the dailies that there was a certain kind of chemistry between the Swan character and the Mercy character just in the exchanges that we had. So it became kind of a not that difficult uh, a transition for Walter and, and Larry Gordon to go, we'll let the girl go with Swan. Uh, so that, was, that changed a lot of the character arc for that, for you know, Swan. Swan was just a badass who fought, now he's a badass who fights and gets the girl. So I mean, you know, that's a big change. <laughs> so, so that was a, that was a huge, you know, change. Uh, but there were, you know, as in any kind of movie, that's made, there are kind of organic things that happen during those three to four months that you're shooting that make sense in the shooting of you go, yeah, this is gonna make sense to do this. So it's true of, of, of pretty much any movie, but you know, we shot pretty much the whole script other than that kind of major change. There were, you know, little changes, but. Brian's always a gentleman, always has been. <laughs> For me, the biggest change was the begin if you look at the beginning of the film and you look at us in the graveyard, we're all trying to find who we are. I mean, James Remar had staked out what he was. Michael had staked out what he was. Snow was just big, strong, silent. But the rest of us, you know, we're you know, Swan's war chief. Okay, wait a minute, big boy. We, we were all saying the lines the same way. There was nothing different. And I said, I'm not going to be able to compete with these characters. They're, way, they're written with the lines that are too strong, too tough. So I said, I've got to do something here. And um, you've heard this story maybe. I don't know if some of you are our age. There was an old cartoon called Hercules. Anybody remember Hercules? And they had this character that was half man and half horse, and he'd run around and say everything twice. He'd go, hey, Herc, Herc, in a high voice. So I said, I'm going to make Vermin, whenever he gets excited, say everything twice and talk in a high, squeaky voice and try to bring some humor into the film, which I did. I started coming up with lines and pulling things in. I mean, I had to be subtle because it wouldn't have fit. And uh, Walter, I think, liked it and ran with it. My part expanded. I was supposed to be killed off somewhere in the film, I think in the original script. And so for me, that character 
sort of brought something to add to the film, that there was this guy in the middle expressing the anxiety that everyone would be feeling, but these guys were too cool to show it, and I just showed it. So that's pretty much a big change for me. Hi, guys. In your own minds, what happened to your characters after you bopped your way back to Coney Island? All right. Hi, guys. What happened in your own minds to your characters once you bopped your way back to Coney Island? In your own Yes, after you bought your way. Um, it, interesting question. The question was, uh, what, what do you think happened to us after Coney Island? Um, I became a social worker. <laughs> I think Swan and Mercy hitched out to California and became surfers. <laughs> I don't have an idea. <laughs> I just wanted to get another acting job. <laughs> okay, so anybody else have a question? Okay, down here. You really need to speak into the mic. Hiya, nice to meet you all. Um, I just wondered what you can remember about the actual casting process. Uh, did you all do a general audition or did you read specifically for specific parts? I read for... This goes back to the Tony Danza thing. The character Cowboy was written, I think, and I think Tony got that role. They were going to have this big presence as Cowboy. So they were, this is just what I recollect, you know, it was 1978. I mean, I'm trying to go back that far. But they weren't sure what to do with the role. Cowboy, Vermin, you know. And I know when I read, and they finally gave me the role, I remember Walter turned to Frank Marshall, who's a, a very well-known producer uh, in Hollywood, and he was an associate producer on the film. And he said, so what do you want to do with him? Cowboy, Vermin, Cowboy, Vermin? And Walter said, I don't know. He said, be Vermin. So that's how I got Vermin. So those two roles, and then Cowboy, I mean, he obviously didn't, was not... Uh, like Tony or I, because he was small and tiny and his presence was different. So uh, that's what I remember uh, reading, that the scenes I did read though were when I said, um, you know, uh, where's your dudes? I had to read David's lines, Cochise, that they put them all together, you know, where's those dudes, you guys like you, girl chicks like you always got dudes around. And of course, you know, hurt me, hurt me was in there and all that. and. Uh, that's, that's what I remember of it. Yeah. Uh, for me, the, the casting process almost didn't happen because uh, I, had, I had trained in the UK. I had gone to the Central School of Speech and Drama for three years in London and worked in various repertory com companies around the UK for another two years. So I was five years here, kind of a classically trained British actor, if you like. Uh, and I never thought I was going to go back to the States. I loved being here, and so, you know, I, I, I started my professional career in the UK. But then I did a play where a musical called The Jesse James Show, and I played Jesse James, and I thought, Jesse James is from Missouri. I grew up in Arkansas. Hell of a lot easier playing Jesse James than it is pretending to be British and then acting on top of it. <laughs> So I, at that point, after five years of being here, I went back to New York. And the casting directors who cast the Warriors also cast a lot of uh, uh, theater in New York. And they knew me as a classically trained theater actor. And so they didn't, they would not, my agents kept calling, because every actor of, of, of our age at the time was being seen for this movie that was gonna shoot in New York called The Warriors. And these casting directors would just tell my agents, no, he's not right for this. You know, he's this British thing. And I'm, you know, he, well, how about he's just an actor, but he, he could not get seen for the movie. So what happened was uh, I had done an independent film the year before in Israel called Madman, and it played the titular role in that. 
and uh, an actress called Sigourney Weaver was in that movie with me, and it was her first film, and Walter Hill was uh, a, a producer and one of the writers of Alien. So they screened this movie called Mad Men that I had done in, uh, and Sigourney had done, and to watch her to see if she was someone that they could cast in, in the Alien movie. And Walter saw my performance in that and called up this, the, uh, the casting agents and said, why have I not seen this Michael Beck guy? So then I finally got in to see them and, you know, and, and read for them, and that's how I got the part. But, you know, had, it, had he not screened that movie, there would be a different swan because I was not going to get seen for that movie. That's how it happened for me. How about you? Um, I, was, I was doing, at the time, uh, off-Broadway uh, production, and like many others, I was seen once or twice for the role of Snow. And I guess for me, it was the more traditional route to get the role. I, I was seen at first, and then I had to do some screen tests, and then ultimately I had to do some readings. And... Uh, I was lucky enough to get it. And, and it just so, I don't know if a lot of you know this, but at the time I got the movie, I did not have an agent or a manager. And there was a manager who knew that a lot of uh, people were being cast for this role and she happened to know Dorsey. Now a lot of you don't know this because we didn't know it. At the time we got the movie, Dorsey Wright and I lived in the same building in the Bronx. It was, wow. a, it was a very large building, and, but we actually did not know each other at the time until we did the movie. So there's a urban, it's not an urban myth, it's true. It's yeah. incredible. So we got another question here? It's an urban truth. Uh, hi guys, I just wanted to ask all, all of your opinions on who would have won the fight between Swan and Ajax had it happened. <laughs> Who would have won the fight? You know, that's the Sorry. third time I've been asked that today. <laughs> it's obvious, and you guys would ask that question? Okay, does anybody else have a question? Um, would there ever have been a sequel to the Warriors movie? No. No sequel? No. Anybody else? I, I, I was just wondering, if for some god-awful reason some, some guy decided to make a remake of your classic film, what would you tell them to make sure it didn't absolutely suck? <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> so does anybody else have any questions? We've got about 10 minutes left. Okay. To sort of quickly answer this, you, a lot of you guys know this because I'm, I'm a film buff. If you don't make a remake within a certain amount of years with the same people, forget it. Um, there's a scene where Luther's on the phone reporting what happened to the meeting. And I was just wondering like, who he was on the phone to, sort of thing. <laughs> uh, who it would be. Boy, I don't even know whether David Patrick Kelly could answer that question. <laughs> But it was a pretty interesting person on the other end, wasn't it? <laughs> Is, uh, you talk about a good actor. I mean, there's an actor that used his imagination. You know the bottle thing that's so iconic from that? I finally found out about a year ago uh, from somebody who knows David Patrick Kelly really well because David is such a method actor that we weren't on the set with him a lot prior to the, the final confrontation on the beach because they just, you know, the rogues didn't, you know, other than the conclave where, uh, you know, he shoots uh, Cyrus, we don't really run into them until the end. So they shot their scenes. But there were a couple of times that we were, at least they were on the same set, like during lunch or something at one or two o'clock in the morning uh, because they were being filmed that night. And he would not talk to, make eye contact, have any communication with any of us. He wore the hat the whole time. So, and he was really an intense kind of actor. So we didn't, we first heard the clicking of the bottles when he did it. 
it was unscripted, it was an improvisation, and people have always wondered, where did that come from? And according, at least from this friend of David that David had shared this with, there was a, a, an old guy in his neighborhood where he lived in the West Village who would stand up like on the fire escape, two floors up, whatever, and he would click bottles when he was loaded and rant at everybody who was in the street walking by. And being the good actor that David Patrick Kelly is, he just filed it away. He just put it in the file. And when, you know, his imagination took over and he brought that thing out, it's, you know, it's, it, when we walk down the street or whatever, I mean, you know, and people recognize us on the street, it's either come out to play or, you know, or the bottle deal. You know, it's it's an it's a brilliant thing from a really brilliant actor. Yeah. Hello there. Um, can you remember much about the initial response to the film when it was first uh, released at the cinemas in the states? And was the response any different in New York where it was filmed compared to other cities around the states? Uh, I remember. Was it David you were with? I don't. I think it was David Harris, Michael, and I went snuck in to one of the showings, and uh, it was packed, and it was absolute chaos. I mean, not chaos where we felt afraid, but just that they were roaring at the fight scenes and and screaming at the film and just loving it and. We looked at each other and, and Michael said, I hope they don't recognize me because I'm going to tell them I just look like Swan. <laughs> Very talking to the yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, then, of course, you know, the, in Boston and California, the, the, the killings started happening, whether it was directly related or an excuse, I don't know. But that's when the film shut down. I mean, we were like the top grossing film for a number of weeks or a month for that whole the time coming out, and then it just, they pulled the promotions, and it just dropped. But there was a greater plan, as you can see here. Paramount couldn't even stop this film. Yeah, I, I've often wondered, uh, you know, had, you know, the adverse publicity that the movie got from a couple of incidents where rival Factions actually went to see the movie at the same time, you know, and, and you know, we were having to answer, you know, press interviews. Do you think, you know, the Warriors caused this? And, you know, all I could say was, how could a movie that you've never seen cause somebody to put a gun in his pocket before he goes to see it? I think there's a predisposition to that prior to. But nonetheless, had this movie had the initial run that it could have had without any kind of controversy, would it have then become the beloved cult classic that people had to dig and find through videos and video games for a whole new generation? I don't know that it would have been, you know? Had it, you know, been just a popular film that everybody saw when it first came out, it's, it's an interesting kind of question to think about, you know? so many amazing one-liners in the film. What's your favorite personal quote and the quote of the movie for you? <laughs> what, do you what do you think is your favorite line? Huh? I think he greeted you with it. <laughs> Some things just don't change. What am I supposed to do? Um, I, I think that Vermin, I mean, I, I do think he has a lot of very memorable lines, so it's hard, you know, I mean, if you think about him, there's a lot of funny lines. I don't know what my favorite, a lot of people like, you know, which I've been telling all the people here today, how much longer we gotta wait? Hey, we might be here forever. I'm sick of waiting for trains. <laughs> and he says, Vermin, sit down and shut up. And I go, okay, okay. Well, Swan didn't talk a lot anyway, you know, he, there's not a whole lot of, you know, you know, let's go, <laughs> let's move. Uh, 
Probably, probably my favorite line, I have to admit, is with the confrontation with the orphans. When Swan's just finally run to the end of his diplomatic skills and just simply looks at the guy and goes, fuck you. <laughs> I think one of the most romantic lines in the history of film is uh, when Michael's walking with uh, Mercy and there's a beat up corsage on the ground and she, he gives it to her and she goes, why are you giving me that? And he goes, I just don't like seeing things go to waste. I thought that was a love affair starting there. However you pulled that off. We're going in like everybody else. <laughs> Nine guys, no weapons. I wish to thank all of you for coming here today, but I wanted to give a big thank you to Michael, Terry, and Brian. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Woo!